back in another convertible again. Well, it is summertime. This time it's a BMW E46 325i Sport. So this is a 2005 BMW 325ci M Sport convertible. Known in BMW circles as the E46 generation, let's take a look around. Now, as I'm sure you know, the E46 was the third generation of the 3 Series, following the E30 and the E36. This generation ran from 1997 to 2006, but in typical BMW fashion, they staggered different body styles coming and going at different times. So even though the last of the previous generation convertibles ended in 1997, the coupe and convertible E46s were the last ones to market about two years later. But then likewise, when the E90 E3 Series finally replaced the E46, it took two years from 2004 when the saloon and estate disappeared of this generation for these versions to finally vanish. So by the time this came onto the road, the saloon equivalent in the showroom would have been the new shape car. Now development of the E46 began way back in 1993 under the two wolf gangs, uh, Zybart and Reitzel, who were in charge of R&D and engineering. In terms of styling, the focus was on making the thing more aerodynamic, but also looking more aggressive. Now, looking at it now, it doesn't, hardly looks aggressive at all. If you compare to the, the massive, massive growls on the new BMWs, which really aren't my cup of tea, um, this thing looks like a model of restraint and, and cool style. I really hope in 20 years time we don't look at the today's like the 7 Series and X7 and look at that thinking, wow, they really held back on it, didn't they? Now the initial styling concept was worked up by Chris Bangle, but then they involved uh, Eric Groplin from Design Works USA, which used to be an independent design consultancy out in California, but then became part of BMW in about 1995. And after that point, they worked together. So the internal BMW design studio and design works they worked together to create this shape which has stood the test of time very well. If you look at the way the E30 has exploded into one of the most expensive and collectible classics out there from BMW, and the E36, well, in M3 version particularly, has gone the same way. Lower, lower entry level E36s are still quite affordable and are a very good classic. But this, this has yet to follow. This is still extremely affordable and an amazing value. Things like the convertible and the M cars, they've gone, you know, become a bit expensive. But you can still buy nice ones for very little money indeed. I mean, we're talking under a thousand pounds for some of the cooking models. This is a car to watch for the future. This is one that's going to be forgotten until they've almost all gone, and then you're going to regret it. Now to get in the bonnet, you do have this funny little catch down here, which pops out when you pull the lever. Then you can see the good stuff. This car comes from a time when BMW's badge on the boot did actually represent what was under the bonnet. So this is a 2494cc or two and a half litre, hence the 325 badge on the boot. It's a straight six M54, a fantastic bit of engine work and we'll enjoy it more on the road in a moment. Now most E46s came with 17 inch alloys, but this is an M Sport version. So you get the different sills and the 18 inch wheels and a few other odds and sods around the car as well. Well, you can tell instantly you're climbing into a BMW. There's just something very BMW-like about it um, from the way that the instruments are just so driver-focused. And this is, I think, the end of the generations of Beamers when the center console was also kind of aimed more at the driver, making it more cockpity than it used to be. Something I do find really interesting climbing in here as an Alpha 145 owner is that this big cutaway in front of the passenger. Under 145, this is really, really exaggerated. So there's a massive space in front of the front seat passenger. In this car, it's a bit more reined in, a bit more restrained, but clearly it's a Chris Bangle favourite thing to do, to give the front passenger just that bit more space and feel a bit more open and less confined in the car. And uh, it's something I don't think I've ever heard anyone mention before, but I do think this is the same idea, just put together in a slightly different manner for a different market. This car was obviously an evolution of the E36. So things like the instruments look very, very similar indeed. But lots of other stuff is utterly different. Everything is way more curvy in this generation of the 3 Series than it was in the previous ones, which are extremely angular. This is all sweeps and curves. As I said in the SLK video recently, um, 90s design was very much a, a mix of lots of straight lines with just gentle curves softening them and very, very pared down, very simple. Even the aggressive look of this car has got a slightly friendly appearance to it. The quality of the fit and finish feels really good in here. Um, everything feels extremely solid, extremely well made, like it's not going to flake and crumble under your fingertips. And the level of equipment in here is really good too. Starting off from the door, we've got twin speakers in both doors, tweeter at the top, mid-range in the bottom, obviously got a door handle made of metal so it's nice and tough, electric mirrors, 
goes without saying, and a door bin, which although it's here, typical of BMW back well, even today, they're not exactly generous with their door bins and in terms of somewhere for your T-shelf, don't even go there, I'm still struggling to find one. In the corner here you've got your headlight rotational switchy on the offy thing, fog lights front and rear and dimmer for the dials which is a nice touch touch which is often overlooked on a lot of cars. And I mentioned before, these dials are beautifully crisp and clear, they're very very BMW-ish with the slightly italicised block letter font making it look like you're going racing, it's all very fast and exciting. Um, in the old sort of graphic style. I can't remember what the font they use on the current generation of uh, 3 and 5 series, but I don't think it's quite as exciting as this. It's pretty more serious. Now on the steering wheel, you've got lots of buttons. You've got cruise control and you've got radio, uh, volume and station, that kind of stuff. I think this might be for your phone controls as well. Now this is not exactly unusual or exciting anymore, but back in the early noughties, this was kind of a big deal. In fact, when I was researching this video, I watched an old Richard Hammond review of this, where he was getting very excited about the fact that there were buttons on the steering wheel. So you kind of forget how things that are now normal and so utterly commonplace were really quite exciting not that long ago. Now, lots of vents in the centre, um, and below that, a BMW business radio. It, this does all the business with the cassette player and the FM. Then you've got your air conditioning and heating and ventilation. It's only single zone on this car, though, although I imagine it goes very hot and very cold. Because it will. Now, I don't just criticise this car for not having enough cubby holes, but there are three... But there are four actually in the middle of the car. There's a little tiny one, I think it's called the pistol box or pistol pocket or something down here, which someone's actually left a, a suite and a single glove in. Curious. And in the middle, we've got two, one above the other. This one slides out and contains a paintbrush and the tiny, tiny ashtray with a 12 volt socket and a little kind of weird circular hole, which I commented on a previous video saying I didn't know what it was for. Apparently it's put lit cigarettes in or something, which seems just weird to me, but you know, I don't smoke, so just, I don't know, the whole thing seems odd. Right, and then we've got a little dish here, which has got an eject button behind it, because, wow, you can plug in your old Nokia or Motorola phone with the correct kit. <laughs> That's excitingly um, uh, enthusiastic. And tucked away behind that for the rear seat passengers, we've got another cubby slash ashtray with a weird circular stubby hole in it. I don't know. And finally over here in the left hand side, got a huge doored but small interior glove box all velour flock lined so it won't rattle but you're not going to get much in the way of tea and sandwiches in there. Down here are your buttons for the roof to go up and down, stability control, which was updated in 2001 from an earlier version of traction control, and here are your four electric window switches in the same places on the E30 where they can still gather dust and stop working. Well, I say dust, more food, drink, and other stuff. Now there are a couple more nice features on this car. For example, when you knock it in reverse, that passenger mirror drops down so you can see the curb so you don't damage your wheels. There's a button here next to the window switches, which means that not only do you open or close one window at a time, you can do all four at once. And finally, of course, it's got an electric roof. So there you go, no handles, no getting out, no messing around, one button and you're done. Now let's talk about these seats. These seats are amazing. I've only really seen like hard fabric or leather or half leather. I've never seen ones like this which are half velour, half Alcantara. They are, they feel lovely and they are so nice to sit in. They're kind of hard sports seats. They're quite firm, but they've got a, a nice kind of soft springiness which makes them actually really quite comfortable. And they are multi-way adjustable in so many directions. And the driver's seat is a memory function seat as well. So they were chucking all the toys at you on this car. And tucked away under the passenger seat, you've even got a little first aid kit just in case. And let's not forget, we've got wood on the dashboard and in these door things, which have faded slightly, but I think they can be uh, corrected. So um, instead of having like a slightly more aggressive, modern, modernistic metal finish or black piano black or something, the first owner chose to go for the uh, good old fashioned plasticky wood. 
which I guess in this kind of car with the automatic gearbox and the roof off, it all kind of works. When you go for the convertible, it's not really the hard edged version, it's kind of the, the softer, more fun version. And there are airbags everywhere, there's airbags in the doors, there's airbags in the dashboard, the steering wheel, uh, behind the horn. Let's try and do a horn test quickly. Oh, horn test. That's decisive, it's a decisive horn, we like that. Now, the back seat, I'm not going to climb into the back seat, partly because I haven't sanitised it and partly because it's not that big. It's two bucket seats only, it's not a five-seater, purely a four-seater car, this thing. With, interestingly, the seat belts coming out from the centre of the, uh, the seat itself. There's not much knee room for grown-ups, but if you've got sort of reasonably old kids, they would be uh, quite comfortable in there and I'm sure they'd enjoy the experience of being in the car. And safety-wise, don't worry, those headrests are more than just for your comfort. They are the spring yuppie shooting rapidly into the sky, deploying a protective cage of steel kind. So if the car does roll over, those things will take the brunt. It does say not to cover them, so you don't put anything, you don't want jettisoned into the sky on top of those. Let's have a quick look in the boot. The trunk area isn't that massive because you've got this big old lump of plastic which is where the roof lives when it's down. You have got this handle here which when the roof is up you can pull that and move this around and expand the load area a little bit more so you can get one goes up to three suitcases according to the diagram. I didn't bring any suitcases I can't prove that. It's around 300 litres and the front bit is okay, the back bit is very shallow indeed. There's a little covered area here for the battery and you've got a six disc multi-changer here in the corner with a slot there for an extra magazine so you can have many many CDs at your disposal and pleasure. There's room for a spare wheel under the, under the floor, a space saver type, and that's kind of all there is to say about this, this boot. It's a boot. One of my favourite things in BMW is, is always to explore this little toolkit in the boot lid. You never know what you're going to find. Hopefully the full set, yes, wow, look at this. This should be on Antiques Roadshow or on the news. This is a BMW, it's over 10 years old and every single item is in the toolkit. It looks like it's never been touched. Wow, even the towing hook is here. That's never there. Now one really great thing about driving the convertible over the saloon, coupe or estate is that you get to enjoy the engine note of that magnificent BMW straight six in all its unfiltered purity and joy because that is one of the great automotive sounds the Alpha V6, the Alpha twin spark, all the Alpha engines and a few other ones, Rover V8, LS1 V8 this BMW straight six is one of the greats it just sounds so good, it's that oh, purposeful, sharp, decisive growl to it it really is a fabulous engine to listen to. And it's got pretty decent performance as well. Even in the kind of muted, civilized version you get, because uh, this is uh, obviously as it left the factory, it still sounds pretty amazing. And this is a great motor. Uh, in this form, the uh, M54 B25 makes 189 horsepower or 181 foot-pound of torque, which is also 245 newton meters if you like it in that particular form of currency. And that means it will accelerate from 0 to 60 in 7.7 .7 seconds and go on to 145 miles an hour, which is not bad for an automatic convertible. Now speaking of which, as I often say, I don't like automatics because I don't. I think it sucks all the fun out of driving. But with convertibles, I kind of give them a free pass because, you know, it's a convertible and it's more about having a bit of a cruise and enjoying the day rather than out and out vehicle dynamics. So I'll kind of let you off. In this case, you have the choice of a five-speed manual or a five-speed auto. Later it was a six-speed manual. And I believe you can do the shump into the left, you can change that up and down manually, here we go. Change that manually for the 30 limit, there we go. But I'll be honest, whenever I do this in an automatic with this, after like the first four shifts, I get bored of it. It's, what's the point? You're, it's still an automatic and it's still doing it when it wants it, with a bit of a delay, so stick it in auto, it's an auto. You bought an automatic, drive it as an automatic, if you wanted a manual. This car has just come into stock at Stone Cold Classics. It's not been detailed yet, it's not been prepared or valeted, and it's not on the website yet, but it will be very soon. So check the link in the description below and see when it comes up online. But the steering on this thing is wonderful. It's so light and direct. It's absolutely brilliant. You feel so connected with the car. I know they, this is still from the days when they were touting it as the ultimate driving machine. But you know, they weren't half wrong. Were, this, is, this is really good. You do feel very, very connected with the car. 
Not like Renault Alpine from the 70s connected, but still very good. Now, sure as eggs is eggs and every odd numbered Star Trek movie is terrible, you can be sure that when every new a manufacturer brings out a new version of an existing car, they'll proudly tout and proclaim how much stiffer the body shell is than the previous version. And in this case, it was no different. The, uh, the tin tops, they said, were 70% stiffer than the outgoing E36 generation cars. Obviously, this is missing a significant um, section of that tin, so it's not quite as rigid. In convertible form, they said it was 20% more rigid, or stiffer, than the E36. And I've got to say, it is commendably um, not fidgety. These aren't the best roads, there's a good fun twisty roads, but the surface is pretty much all over the place. And I'm really not getting anything at all in the way of scuttle shake worth mentioning. And it's fairly, being a sport model, it's fairly, fairly firmly sprung as well, so you'd expect a bit more sort of jitter and thump. But this thing's good, this is really impressive. As you look around the car, both internally and externally, you, apart from being able to tell, yes, it is a Chris Bangle design, you can also spot pretty easily the California influence in it as well. You can sort of tell that kind of slightly languid, easy going look about it. It was meant to be more aggressive looking than previous generations, but at the same time, it's got a certain, I don't know, California coolness about it. Now, for a long time, these things were the preserve of modifiers. I'm not gonna say boy racers, that's a stupid phrase. But yeah, these were at the absolute choice of the modifying fraternity because they were a great car with a great chassis that looked good to start with and you could only make it better, really. Well, some of them didn't. So finding a car like this, which is completely unmodified, is fantastic. Maybe because it's an automatic. They wanted the manuals for like, more driftability, more, you know, more roadability, I think Americans call it. because you often seem to find that the original E30 uh, 325s, both in saloon and estate, the manuals get destroyed on the drift track, whereas the autos seem to live a cosseted, quite, quite a friendly life. You can find a pretty decent automatic, but you'll struggle to find a nice manual. Oh, this makes such a great noise. Why am I being converted into like a convertible? Obviously the weight distribution will be a bit all over the place on this car, not the pure 50-50 BMW I like to talk about with the heavy old hood stashed over the back axle. But it still feels pretty good turning really sharply into a corner, gripping and going. I would prefer it as a manual because you get half around the corner, it suddenly decides to drop a gear. That's automatics for you, not the car's fault. Now, as I said, this is a sport model, which means it's got the lower, harder suspension, but even so, it's still fairly supple and gives you a nice ride over these pretty awful back roads. And these seats, these seats are really comfortable. These are the uh, suitably buckety, and they grip you really nicely. And there's loads of adjustment. You've got the little pull-out lumbar support thingy for your knees down there, which makes it even more adjustable and just right. Well, thanks for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this rather lovely 325. Uh, I've always fancied a 325. I've always wanted one of the earlier ones, the E36 or the E30 shape, but this has kind of opened my eyes to how good this generation is as well. I mean, this is kind of the upcoming classic generation. Give it five years, this will be the collector's item one. And this is rather a good car. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to support the channel, maybe buy a sticker. There's a link down in the description below. See you again next time. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.